All right, let's get started. Good afternoon. I'm Lara Nettlefield, a faculty member at the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University. Welcome to our Technology and Human Rights Speaker Series, which is now in its fifth year. Um, some of the past series speakers are in the audience today, and they include Brian Bethlendorf, Executive Director of the Hyperledger Project, Matt Mamoudi of Cambridge University, and now Amnesty International, and Dragana Kaurin, an alumna of the Human Rights Studies MA program, founder of the Localization Lab and former fellow at Harvard's Berkeley Klein Center. Today, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our speaker, Rafael Yuste, whose talk is titled, Neuro Rights, Human Rights Guidelines for Neurotechnology and AI. Professor Yusta, MD, PhD, is a neuroscientist who studies the cerebral cortex at Columbia University. He is Professor of Biological Sciences, Director of the Neurotechnology Center, and Co-Director of the Kavli Institute for Brain Circuits. He led researchers who proposed the U.S. Brain Initiative and coordinated the launch of the International Brain Initiative. He has received awards for his research from the Mayor of New York City, the Society for Neuroscience, and the Director of the U.S. National Institutes of Health. He shared the 2018 Talberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize for his science and ethics advocacy work. Thank you, Professor Eustet, for joining us today. I will now hand over to you. Thank you, Lara. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to um, be here with you and be part of your series. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen. I encourage everyone to ask questions. You can do that by either raising your hand or putting the questions in the chat and uh, Lara or Maggie will alert me uh, if I uh, miss them. So, uh, and I'm talking today about an uh, ethical issue that uh, relates to neurotechnology and our position is that this is a human rights issue, and this is a novel position. People normally don't associate uh, neurotechnology with uh, human rights, and we think it's actually a critical uh, aspect of it. So, uh, and I'm talking to you representing a group of people, which is called the Neuro Rights Initiative, which is based on this building from which this picture was taken. We took it actually from the top of the building uh, without permission. Uh, <laughs> And you can see uh, uh, it's at the top of the Northwest Corner Building at Columbia that will play a role later in the talk. So um, let me start from the beginning. So we are neuroscientists. We try to understand how the brain works. Uh, and we and many people around the world for now more than 100 years, generation after generation in a network that extends through space and time. The reason why we find that the brain is so interesting is actually triple. The first reason is because this hardware, this organ, generates all of our cognitive and mental abilities. So what we call our mind, the human mind, is actually generated as a product of this tissue. So if we understood how this tissue works, how the brain works, we would understand the mind, the human mind, scientifically from the inside for the first time. Uh, so this is uh, this could be a, a fundamental step in in humanity to understand ourselves, who we are, understand our our minds. We are a species that defines itself by our cognitive abilities. The second reason is clinical, as you probably know. Every one of you has family members or friends that suffer from mental or neurological diseases, and, and you know perfectly well that they have no cure. It's the dark uh, corner of medicine. Uh, for most of these diseases, not only there's no cure, we don't even understand the pathophysiology, which is what the doctors, what we call uh, the problem of a disease is when the physiology, the, norm, the normal function of the, the organ, the tissue goes wrong, and that's the pathophysiology. For essentially almost all mental diseases, we don't understand the pathophysiology. And for most of the neurological diseases, we don't understand it. So it's very hard to fix a problem in the machine if you don't know how it works. That's the problem with, uh, with medicine. And we could only do that scientifically. We understand what is the, the, the basic function of the, of the brain. And the third reason why it's important to understand the brain has to do with the economy and with the technology. So just to give you some numbers, the human brain has a number of neurons and you, you see how drawings of these beautiful neurons 
um, below. So just um, typical human has about close to a hundred billion neurons, okay? That's about three times the number of nodes in the entire internet of the earth, okay? So we have the equivalent of three internets, each of us inside our, our heads. And all of this is powered by the equivalent of a 20 watt uh, light bulb. Okay, so we're running like three internets on, on, the, on, the, on a, a 20 watt uh, uh, budget, energy budget. No? So obviously nature is using ways of computing which must be much more powerful than what we can do today with digital computers. So if we understood how the brain works, not just the brain of the human, but the brain of, of animals, we'd be able to extract these algorithms and probably revolutionize uh, our technology. For all these reasons, it's, it's, it's essential, really, it's urgent, particularly for the patient's point of view, to try to figure out how the brain works, but we haven't been able to do it. And why is it? So uh, when things don't work, you normally go to the beginning of the journey and examine the assumptions that you made at the beginning, just in case there's one of these assumptions that's wrong. And it turns out that the central assumption in neuroscience, one that runs for over a century now, it's what we call the neuron doctrine. And this was stated by uh, Cajal and Sherrington more than hundred years ago. And the neuron doctrine, which they call it a doctrine as an article of religious belief, not a theory or a hypothesis, the neuron doctrine states that the unit of structure and the function of the brain is the individual neuron. So people like them used methods that were single neuron methods, like these Golgi methods or electrical recording, for example, to describe the structure and the function of the brain of animals or patients, neuron by neuron. Okay. And this is mostly what neuroscientists have been doing for the last hundred years. We're trying to take apart a machine, look at that individual components with exquisite sensitivity and describe what these neurons look like and what the, these neurons do one by one. And if you think about it, I just told you the brain has about a hundred billion neurons. To try to understand a system with so many neurons by going at it one by one, it's a little bit like trying to watch a movie in a TV if you look at a single pixel, okay? So it doesn't matter for how long you look at the one pixel, you never will understand what's playing in the movie. And the reason has to do with the fact that the images in the movie, like these kids jumping, each of them, it's, uh, it's what we call in science an emergent property. An emergent property is a property of a system that has many components that by definition is not present in the individual components. So in this case, an emergent property of the image is not present in the individual pixels. It arises, it emerges from the interactions between pixels, interactions in time, interactions in space, interactions in color. And when that clicks, boom, that builds the image. And only that uh, is the, uh, the functional unit of the movie. If you don't understand that, you will never understand what's playing in the movie. So these TV screens is an example of emergent properties. There are emergent properties everywhere around us in nature. Physicists and chemists have been studying emergent properties for centuries. The, maybe the most famous one that was figured out about a hundred years ago was magnetism. If you, you take a magnet apart into individual atoms. The atoms are not magnetic, but if you put them together, the system becomes magnetic. And that a hundred years ago caused a huge headache to physicists because they said, well, how can you get something out of nothing? If there's no magnetism in the atom, how come there's magnetism when they're interacting together? The answer for that is not like magic, it's the interactions that matter. And uh, if you just think about your own life and about human society, democracy, all of that, it's all emergent properties. Now, emergent properties have not been traditionally studied in science because they're very difficult to study. Because not only you have to understand the particles, you have to understand their interactions. And these interactions have to be measured and they're often nonlinear, which means they're 
very difficult to mathematically uh, describe. So now if you go back to our problem, to the brain, what if the brain is not only full of emergent properties, I would argue is the mother of all emergent properties because if you want to build a system for emergent properties, what do you do? You build a system like this TV screen with as many pixels as possible and you try to connect them all as much as possible. And this is exactly what's going on in evolution. Brains in evolution are becoming enormous, gigantic and accumulating the human brain and each of our neurons is actually connected to an also enormous number of other neurons, as if the game that nature is trying to play is to build emergent properties. If you think like this, this could explain why we don't have a theory of how the brain works, because no one has ever seen this TV screen yet. So what can we do to, to fix the problem? The problem is one of methods, developing methods to look at all the pixels at once be able to record the activity of all the neurons, not one by one, all at once. And this was the germ of the idea that uh, we presented to President Obama that became the US Brain Initiative. It was launched in 2013, a large scale project involving today more than 500 labs, uh, estimated budget of $6 billion, of which this year's, uh, next year's budget is supposed to be 560, approved by Congress. And the idea is simply to develop methods, to do three things. To read the activity of every neuron. This is the goal number one, which is essentially to watch that TV screen. The second goal is to be able to change the activity of every neuron at will. And the reason it's important to do that has to do with, with the clinic. No, it's not going to help us to watch the brain of schizophrenic in all its glory and see every neuron fire and see how this emergent properties are abnormal if we cannot go in and fix the problem. We have to intervene. And the third goal, it has to do with the mathematics and the analysis of these vast amounts of data. It's to develop essentially the theory, the tools to, the, to describe these emergent properties so that we can actually understand them scientifically and, and clinically. So this project, uh, again, is going on. It's developing methods that are used. And just like it happened with the Human Genome Project, which was the model for this project. These methods are first tried in small animals like worms, flies, fish, and eventually leading to vertebrates, mice, uh, mammals, and the human brain. So the goal not maybe not to 15 years to be able to record all these 100 billion neurons, and that's really <laughs> a serious uh, challenge, but at least to record, let's say, all the neurons in an area of the brain of a patient, for example. And that could be extremely important for medicine. It could be a milestone for, for medicine and science. No? So this brain initiative that President Obama uh, launched uh, was uh, emulated by other initiatives throughout the world. And since 2013, there are now other initiatives in many other countries, including China, Japan, Korea, Australia, Canada, Israel and also the European Union who launched a similar initiative at the same time as the US one. And all of these initiatives, just like it happened with the Human Genome Project, have been coordinated together in an international brain initiative. And this happened in 2017 in a declaration that was signed in Canberra in Australia, hosted by the Australian Brain Initiative. So now we're not talking just about the US doing this, the entire, um, advanced uh, nations in the, in the world are involved in this race to build new technology uh, for all these reasons that I described earlier, particularly for the economic reason. That was the argument that President Obama used in the State of the Union address to convince Congress to support this initiative. People think, and not just the countries, the companies think that uh, new technology could be uh, the next technological revolution I could replace uh, iPhones with something that we call brain computer interfaces that I will describe in a second. So, um, so what is neurotechnology? It's very simply put, it's methods to do two things, to record the activity of, of neurons, of brain tissue, okay, to read that activity and to change, manipulate that activity, to write activity into the brain tissue. No? And, uh, and this matters because the behavior of an animal 
of a person, in fact, the entire mind, the mental world of a person is determined by the neural activity. So if you can read and write neural activity, in principle, you can interfere with the behavior of an animal or a person. Let's go into this with a little bit more detail. I'm going to show you data from our own lab at Columbia. So we're interested in understanding perception in mice, visual perception. So here you have a little mouse that's looking at the screen and we're showing the mouse different types of patterns of bars of lights and dark. No? And when the animal sees these horizontal patterns, we train the animal not to lick from the spout where we're giving the animal some juice. This is another horizontal pattern. The animal is not licking. And then when we give the animal, we show the animal a vertical pattern of, of bars, we train the animal to lick. Okay, so this is a vertical pattern and you can see the animal is starting to lick. So by licking or no licking, we know what the animal is seeing or what the animal thinks he is seeing. Now, simultaneously, we're using advanced microscopy, something called two photon microscopy uh, to measure the activity of groups of neurons in the visual cortex of the mouse. So we're monitoring the brain. This is advanced neurotechnology, monitoring what these neurons are doing while the animal is looking at this uh, screen and is behaving. And the experiment that we're doing uh, is the following. We show the animal a stimulus. As I told you, when we show the animal, let's say these vertical bars of light, a group of neurons, in this case, the group number one gets activated and the animal licks. And then when we show the animal the horizontal bars of light, a different group of neurons that we quoted here uh, with number two in a different color, and the animal doesn't leak. So the experiment we did was we stop the, the screen, we turn on a laser to activate neurons optically to play back these neurons, number ones, that were activated when the animal saw the visual stimulus that made him leak. And what we found, we and others have been replicated uh, in a couple of labs since then, uh, is that uh, the artificial activation with our laser of these leak neurons make the animal leak. More interestingly, the way in which the animal leaks is identical whether he sees a stimulus to lick or whether we play those neurons, like playing the piano, we play the neurons in this brain and make him leak. There's no difference. The animal interprets the activation of these neurons as its own perception. So we're controlling the behavior of the animal by controlling its perception. In a way, we're playing the mouse like a puppet, making the animal lick or no lick, whether we play these neurons in blue or these other neurons in green. This is an example of what new technology can do today with, uh, with animals. And um, you can say, well, who cares about animals? But what we can do today with animals, we can do tomorrow with humans. And this hasn't escaped uh, the, the, the press. So this is an example, this is already a couple of years old of uh, Scientific American economists arguing that the next frontier this is the interface between the human brain and computers and technology. So let's talk about what's going on with humans. So let's first talk about technologies to read activity in humans. Uh, for technical reasons, it's much easier to read than to write into the brain. And this is something that you should all understand if you're trying to learn a foreign language, uh, it's much easier to read than to actually write and speak it. No? So, um, so this is the work of my colleague, Jack Galan at Berkeley. And uh, he's a, a leader uh, using fMRI of, uh, to scan the brains of volunteers, the cerebral cortex. And what you're looking at is the maps of activity of the entire cerebral cortex of, homies, of a volunteer. And in this case, the cortex, which is normally crumpled up inside our skull, has been laid out flat computationally so that this is one hemisphere and the other hemisphere, and the pixels in color are the areas that get activated at any particular time in the cortex. 
when the person is looking at an image. Let's say they show the volunteer an image of a dog and they take this picture. This is the areas of the cortex, of the cerebral cortex of the, of the person that light up when the person sees a dog. And then they show the person another picture of a cat and they take another map. And they do that over and over again about a hundred times with a hundred different pixels, pictures. So they have a collection of a hundred maps. And then comes the interesting thing. They tell the person, okay, close your eyes and think of one of the images that we showed you. And the person thinks of a dog. They scan his brain and said, you're thinking of the dog, correct. And then even more interesting, they say, now think of something we have not shown you, okay? And the person thinks of whatever the door of uh, her house. And they scan their brain and said, well, they don't nail it, but they get pretty close. They said, well, you're thinking of a building and it's something about that building. They don't yet precisely identify the image that you're conjuring, but they're getting increasingly close. Let me show you an example of this decoding algorithm at work. So in this case, uh, the volunteer is watching a movie that you're going to see on the right side of the screen. So this is a movie made up by splicing pieces of different movies. And on the left are the words of the images that the algorithm is decoding from scanning the brain of the person in real time. So this is an algorithm that's running on real time. So, uh, so this is what the scanning decoding algorithm, it's predicting that the person has in his head, in her head. No? So, uh, so for instance, here you have uh, the water, you have the beach, you have some buildings, you have some palm trees, and look at what the algorithm is decoding. Cloud, city, building, tree, walking, people, you have a, uh, some, uh, a couple of actresses that are talking, and now uh, bingo, then the word woman comes up, they're talking to a man in a room. No? So this is an example of uh, what has been done already since 2008. And again, with better scanners, with better algorithms and with better uh, uh, databases, this decoding is becoming uh, more and more powerful. And you can say, well, but this, you need an fMRI machine. So uh, you have to go into a hospital. Well, maybe not anymore. So this is an example of new technology that's now been uh, commercially sold by a company called Kernel, which is a portable scanner of brain activity. It's a little bit like fMRI. These are examples of images taken with this portable scanner. I would say they have pretty good signal to noise. It's not as good as a, as a hospital magnetic scanner, but this is portable, okay? So in principle, you can put the two and two together. Well, you can now run these algorithms on this type of activity and in principle, start to decode uh, at least the images that people are conjuring in their head as an example of, of the kinds of things you can decode. Uh, let's talk about, uh, this is about reading, decoding. Let's talk about writing. How about, again, these are, the writing is going behind. It's, it's a few years behind the, the reading for, uh, but let's just take a look at what people are doing. So uh, let me show you an example. This is now uh, a, a woman that has electrodes in, surgically implanted in her head. So this is an example of invasive neurotechnology. It's invasive because they require neurosurgery. She is uh, paralyzed and uh, she's trained the computer through the signals from these electrodes that are recording the activity of four neurons in the motor cortex to uh, move this robotic arm by thinking. This is a classical example of a brain-computer interface, the connection between the brain and a computer or a machine. And in this case, this woman who's paralyzed, this is from the work of my colleagues at Brown, John Donoghue's group. Uh, she's been able to uh, drink by her own volition for the first time. So this device that, that she has is a very primitive type of BCI. Now there are much more sophisticated ones getting built and guess what? The best ones are getting built at Columbia. So this is the work of my colleague, 
uh, Ken Shepard, who works two floors under us, electrical engineering, and uh, he leads a team of uh, contractors working for DARPA, military uh, research agency, to build the mother of all BCIs. It's a flexible and wireless chip, which has one million electrodes, okay? The movie I showed you, this woman had four electrodes implanted. There were only one of them that was actually getting used to train the, the device. Here, we're going from one to one million. And these are uh, electrodes to both record the activity of neurons or to stimulate the brain. The idea is that this chip that is flexible, as you can see, can be implanted surgically on the, let's say, the visual cortex of a blind person as a visual prosthesis. So you'll be able to connect a camera wirelessly to this BCI and pipe in into the primary visual cortex of a person, the image that the camera is seeing. And just like it happens with other prostheses, like with cochlear implants, it is expected that this type of visual prosthesis will be able to provide uh, a low grade type of vision with equivalent of about 100,000 pixels to a person. So this could be fantastic, a breakthrough for a uh, cure for blindness. But as you can imagine, you could put this on a person that is not blind. And instead of connecting it to uh, a camera, you can connect it to, uh, to sensors, to, uh, to weapons. You can connect it to databases. You can have uh, Wall Street analysts being connected directly to the stock market uh, uh, feed. Uh, this opens the way for human augmentation. Uh, now, this is still uh, invasive. You still need neurosurgery to put something like this inside your, your head, but there are many companies devoting now a lot of funds to build non-invasive uh, BCIs. In fact, this last year, 2020, is the first year that the investment of neurotechnology in the US from the private sector was larger than the investment by a factor of four and investment from the, uh, from the federal government. So we have this uh, cat out of the box situation where this technology that can be used for great uh, breakthroughs in medicine and science could also be used uh, for all kinds of purposes, including uh, mental and cognitive and sensory augmentation of humans. And again, this is not science fiction. I'm showing you examples of decoding in real time of a patient for volunteer. And, uh, and this is the types of PCIs that are getting built for patients and maybe for other uses. Um, should mention in this regard that uh, the richest person in the world today, Elon Musk, has a company called Neuralink. And the purpose of this company is to mentally augment people by embedding artificial intelligence into the brain with similar type of chips. They're actually less advanced than the ones that we're building at Columbia. Uh, they're also wireless. Uh, and Elon Musk's company has built a robot that can do all the neurosurgery required in one hour. So he's thinking about mass implanting of people uh, with chips. So motivated by all of these problems, a group of us, uh, concerned scientists, uh, clinicians, uh, uh, bioethicists, uh, uh, people coming from the tech industry, and importantly, representatives from all the uh, brain projects from around the world met here at Columbia in our building, which is here, this is our building, in 2017. And we hold ourselves up for three days and we came up with a, side, uh, a series of ethical guidelines for new technology and AI. We call ourselves the Morningside Group because we're in the Morningside campus and we published this paper in Nature alerting our colleagues and society in general that this is a problem where ethical guidelines are badly needed. Now, I should mention in this picture that our building is right next to this building, which is Pupin Hall. It's in the Natural Registry of Historic Places because in its basement, the first uh, nuclear uh, reactor was built. And the group of physicists that built this nuclear reactor in the physics department at Columbia were this same group of people that started the Manhattan Project, which was was called Manhattan because it started right there in Manhattan. And this group built the first atomic bomb and changed the history of mankind. And what you should know is that the same group of physicists were the first ones in line demanding ethical and societal guidelines for atomic energy. 
we have a responsibility as scientists that create this technology to alert society of the negative impact and consequences that it could have to make sure that we put guardrails so that it develops for the benefit of, of humanity. So our group, our position of this Morningside group was that this is a human rights issue. You can try to patch regulation here and there with every new technology that comes on the, on the market, on the, gets invented. But because new technology deals with the human brain and because the human brain creates the human experience, creates the human mind, we're, we can decode and manipulate the essence of our humanity. And we think that this is a human rights issue. And uh, at the level of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this is a picture of the um, the human, uh, actually the, the Human Rights Museum in, in Santiago, Chile, the Museum de la Memoria. And in the entrance to the museum, you have the Universal Declaration written on the wall. So our position is to write five more new rights, human rights on that wall. And this is what we call neural rights or cerebral rights. And these are the five critical issues that we think uh, arise from the application and development of neurotechnology. One is protecting protection of mental privacy so that the contents of our minds cannot be decoded and without our consent uh, because it represents our, 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 our minds. And in fact, uh, uh, some of the, in the movie that I show you, some of the words that get decoded were words that may, that the person may not be aware of. They could be subconscious, okay? So in principle, you could use neurotechnology to decode the subconscious of a person. The second uh, neural rights is the right to our own identity, to our own self. Uh, again, the self, which neuroscientists, we don't understand exactly how the self is generated, but one thing we know for sure is generated by the brain. And we can actually alter that. There's cases now of patients that have deep brain stimulation that report uh, alter sense of selves when the stimulator is, is, is activated. So we think this is a basic human right. In fact, this should be the first human right, the right to your own self, because if you don't have the right to your own self, but what do you want the other human rights for? No? The third is the right to our own agency, our own free will, our decision-making. As you can tell from the movies I showed you in the mouse, we can drive the poor mouse like a puppet. I think we should have the human, the, the basic right so that our cognitive decision-making is actually internal, is not taken over by the outside. And in this mouse experiment, I remind you the critical conclusion is that the mouse interprets this external manipulation as internal, as if we're his own decision. So if they interfere with your, your brain, you're going to interpret that as this is what you want. You would not detect it as external. Humans have trying to interfere with each other behavior for forever. But uh, if you read the newspaper or look at your, your news feed in, in Facebook, on Twitter, you know it's external. Whereas in this case, you're gonna be dealing with an internal uh, decision making. The last couple of human rights that we think are necessary have to do with this issue, societal issues. Uh, one is the cognitive augmentation. This will happen whether we want it or not. It's already starting to happen with the iPhones that were cognitively augmented in a way. A GPS tells us where we are in the city where we've never been. But imagine that as Elon Musk wants to do in your head, uh, fracturing society into uh, uh, humans that are augmented and humans that are not augmented. We think uh, access to cognitive augmentation uh, should be uh, under the universal principle of justice and it should be regulated uh, to ensure its fairness. So it doesn't depend on you or on your money whether you get augmented or not to prevent fracturing of society. The last one has to do with the protection from bias and uh, discrimination of the algorithms that are used by neurotechnology, which are algorithms of AI. This problem has to do a lot with AI because neurotechnology and AI are, are sort of merging. Uh, the other um, thought we put on the table, the Morningside Group, is that this, uh, as a solution to all this complicated uh, position, besides a human rights approach to it, we propose to follow the medical model. And what do we mean by the medical model? Well, you can think of medicine as another technology uh, that's more than 2,000 years old uh, that has been used, is used to manipulate the human body. 
and like technologies like atomic energy, it's they're neutral. You can use it for good and for bad. So you can use all the knowledge of medicine for good and for bad. But guess what? For the last 2,000 years, it's only been used essentially, almost without exception, for the benefit of humanity. Why? Because there is a deontology embedded in the profession. There is a, techno, a Hippocratic oath. Uh, there is a medical deontology that is codified. So all of this means that any doctor anywhere in the world in any time of history uh, treats the patient with dignity, with beneficence, and uh, with a sense of justice. Now this is this is unavoidable associated with with medicine. So this is something that we could copy as we think together through how to deal with this new revolution of neurotechnology and AI, which are going to change the human condition. So uh, what has happened since we met uh, here 2017, uh, we created the Neuro Rights Initiative at Columbia and you have the URL underneath and we have a newsletter that I'm reminded to remind you, you can check. Uh, the Neuro Rights Initiative is essentially a, uh, a uh, a startup, a pro bono advocacy startup to promote uh, the, uh, the diff uh, diffusion of, uh, of these uh, neural rights, of this way of thinking, neural protection. And uh, we do uh, three things. We first, our first uh, uh, platform of, of first approach is defensive to try to prevent bad things from happening. And this would involve regulation at the human rights level and also in different countries, and I'll explain that in a second. The second type of approach is more proactive uh, to prevent the people who can do harm not to do it. And this is copying the medical model instead of a Hippocratic oath, we're pushing for a technocratic oath to be adopted by the tech industry and the new technology industry, similar to the, uh, to the Hippocratic oath for medics. And the third uh, approach, our third angle is strictly technical engineering. Can we devise technical ways by which we can minimize problems, for example, uh, mental privacy? There are now very uh, original, uh, powerful ways in the tech industry and in the computer science uh, 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 devices to try to prevent uh, that the data leaves the device, like I'm talking about federated learning, um, uh, new types of cryptography, differential privacy. So we're working on trying to, to explore this as a technical solution to the problem so that uh, to minimize the impact, the negative in, impact that this new technology could have in, in society. So an example of what we've been doing, uh, let me tell you the work that's going on in Chile, which is very exciting. So as we speak, the Chilean Senate uh, is considering two uh, bills. One is a constitutional amendment to Article 19 of the Chilean Constitution that defines mental integrity as a basic human rights. This has passed uh, all the votes in the Senate in Chile with unanimous support and is about to be sent to the House in Chile. Uh, and after discussion in the House, if this is approved by the House, then it will become the law in Chile. It will be one country in the world where it's actually in the Constitution. <laughs> mental integrity is a human right. Uh, the second thing that's going on in Chile is a bill of law, which it's called the Neuro Rights Bill or Neuro Protection Bill, which applies the medical model to neurotechnology. It legally defines for the first time what is neurotechnology, what is brain computer interface, defines data from neural uh, interfaces as a body organ legally and applies to it the existing Chilean regulation for donation and transplantation of body organs, which is the most the strictest medical regulation that you have. So this new rights bill has also been discussed in the Senate. So far it's been approved with unanimous support and it, it will go after the constitutional amendment. So hopefully in March, when the, the House and the Senate reconvene after their summer break in the Southern hemisphere, they may pass this into law and this would become actually the law of the land in Chile. Uh, something uh, incipient is happening in Spain. Uh, Spain has the Secretary of State for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, it depends directly of this, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the Vice President of the government and uh, the uh, 
Secretary of State is Carmen Artigas, who's here in this picture. And she has uh, a council, council of AI, National Council of AI, and uh, they've uh, announced the digital rights chapter, uh, which essentially defends the rights of the citizens of Spain uh, from all kinds of digital technologies. And in section 24, they specify new technology and they actually adopt the human rights as uh, stated by the uh, Morningside Group as the proposal. This is a proposal that's now in open consultation with the citizenship in Spain. And after incorporating the comments from citizens, this will be sent to the parliament for their discussion and potential approval. So Spain could be another country after Chile where this will have, these protective measurements will have some uh, support. Uh, I wanted to finish also with uh, a little bit of work that we're doing on the technocratic oath idea. And this is work in Chile, in Spain, in the Basque country, which is also part of Spain and in the US. Uh, and particular collaboration with our colleague, uh, Xavi Uribe Chavarria from a company called uh, Sherpa, which is in the Basque country. Uh, very proactive in this regard. We've uh, essentially uh, generated a, a model of a technocratic oath that could be uh, a pledge, a personal pledge that could be taken on a personal basis upon your conscience by uh, employees uh, of the tech industry and the neurotechnology industry and trainees, a little bit like the doctors do as in medical school. And that would guarantee the principle of beneficence, justice, dignity, and transparency. A very simple oath that just like with medicine, regardless of what happens in the national parliaments, Something like this could be a bottom-up uh, approach that could have a, a strong uh, impact in the in the industry. And just my last slide, uh, I may be uh, making you very worried, but uh, I'm very optimistic about the future. So of course we are uh, we have to have responsibility and do this uh, well. But I think we're honestly we're at the brink of a new renaissance. This new technology, understanding of the human brain. It's going to be a fundamental change in our culture, in our history, you know, for many reasons. Now, uh, you can think compare this without exaggeration to what happened in the Renaissance, where the humans finally understood that we were not the center of the universe, and we understood our place in, in the world, and, and this led to the birth of modern science and medicine, a revolution in the art, in the in the literature. Uh, understanding that the body is not sacred, that it's not uh, essentially uh, untouchable. Uh, and something like this could happen now, except with the brain. So understanding our minds, who are we? What is, what's a human? What's the defining characteristic? We treat ourselves as we have some sort of black box of which all our behavior emerges, but we'll be able to get in and, and understand it. And this has to have a major impact, not just in, in science, in, in medicine, but also in our society. Everything that we do as humans has to do with the brain, you know, from our education to our, our commercial activities, the law, uh, actually our wars. This is also generated by, by maybe pathological brain. We can maybe understand and diffuse these conflict uh, areas before they, they lead to these terrible, massive wars. We're still killing each other by the millions in Rafa, we have lost your volume. Hang on one sec. That was uh, that was scary. <laughs> I was just booted. <laughs> Good thing it didn't happen during the talk. Yeah, now you're back. You're back. <laughs> anyway, I'm delighted to be back. Hello, everyone, and I'm delighted to take any questions. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for such a, a wonderful and rich talk. If you have a question, you can either put it in the chat or you can 
raise your hand in the Zoom function and I'd be happy to call on you. Um, Raphael, let me just start off. Could you explain the, the challenges that you've encountered? Because I know you've traveled around the world um, and have been promoting this initiative for a few years now in translating this area of science to the, the kind of traditional human rights community, which doesn't have a lot of experience. In yeah, this area. exactly. So it's a little bit like uh, bridging two fields uh, and we've encountered many challenges. Uh, so some uh, challenge in the form and in the content. Mm -hmm. uh, challenge in the, in the, let me try the ones in the content, which are the deeper ones. Some people say, you're too early. This is, is, is you're exaggerating, it's not happening. Uh, with, uh, with due respect to the critics, uh, uh, I think I provide you some examples. So there are many examples of what's going on. Uh, and these are the things that we know is, is going on. There are many other things that we don't know is going on. <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the industry or in the military and in different countries. And I think these are uh, already very worrisome. Uh, let me just point to perhaps the, the thing that gives me the biggest headaches is a project that it's, uh, uh, it's part of Facebook. It's actually one of their uh, secret projects. Uh, it's called uh, Brain to Text. It's a wonderful project is to be able to wear a portable BCI, a little bit like that helmet that I showed you, so that by thinking you could write on the on the screen. So instead of using our fingers, you'll be able to just type at 100 words per second. That's their goal uh, on a vocabulary of about a thousand a thousand words. So um, and the reason this gives me a lot of headaches is because the minute this gets uh, sold, then uh, we could have a huge. Uh, it's like opening the floodgates of mental privacy, and then just like it happened with the internet. You cannot go back. It's going to be very hard to regulate privacy if all these things are already out there. And we, as of now, these type of devices don't have any regulation. They're treated as consumer electronics. So I don't think this is too early. Answer to your uh, to the to the critics. Uh, there are some other people who say it's too late. <laughs> it's already happened. It's already too late. Like and the military already doing that. Like okay, so I'm a little bit more optimistic there, and I think uh, they too early and too late sort of cancel out. Then we have people that say, and this goes more to the forum, said this is not a human rights issue. Uh, I respectfully disagree. We I actually speak on behalf of this group, the Morningside group. No, we disagree. We think this affects the heart of the human condition. <laughs> this more than anything else I know, the brain is yourself. In fact, uh, there's a before we were talking earlier about Basque, the way you in Basque, you talk about yourself. You said, my buru, my buruan, nire buruan, my head. So for the Basque already, in ancient language, the head is you. You are your head. Mm -hmm. So now this is the technology that gets into your head. So we think it's a human rights issue. There's some people who say, well, the human rights already, uh, no reason to touch the universal declaration. It's all covered. Uh, respect that position, but we disagree. There is the human rights to dignity. And you could say, well, all of this is buried inside dignity, but it's just buried, very deeply. And we need to provide uh, uh, countries, uh, the citizens and, 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 and judges with, with some legal interpretation that is clear enough. Uh, and because everyone has a different idea of what's dignity. So we think this needs to be added to the universal declaration. Um, so, uh, and then in terms of the, uh, there are other people in terms of the form, there are other people who say, this is impossible. You cannot do that. It's like, uh, there's a saying in Spanish to try to put gates on the sea or gates on the, on the countryside. It just, you're going to get surpassed left and right. No? Uh, so we would bring in the, uh, the famous Colin Rich dilemma that you may know about that when a new technology gets invented, you don't really know. People don't know what it's good for, but it's very easy to regulate. <laughs> But then once it's, it's anchor and it has some uh, uh, use, then you know perfectly well what it can do and what it cannot do, but then it's too late to regulate. And I think we experience all of that with uh, uh, digital platforms, with social media, with the internet. So uh, it's very hard to regulate at this point. 
So I think we're still uh, at the time where this can be regulated uh, effectively. So I don't think this is impossible. I don't think this is a, a crazy quest here. And then uh, just going back to the, to the form, uh, we have to straddle different fields. So this is an interdisciplinary problem. It, it lands between science, a particular type of science, industry, a particular type of industry, the tech industry and AI, and the human rights uh, uh, world. No, so, and there's some links between those three uh, actors and stakeholders, but it's not. Uh, we just organized a meeting at, at Columbia in November on, on BCI and merging these three groups of people. And many people have never been to a meeting with people from the other side before. So, so we need to, this is why I'm delighted to speak here. We need to start making bridges, getting this message across because this obviously this is a classic uh, interdisciplinary problem. Thank you, Rafa. Um, Tom Gruber, and if you could, uh, if you feel comfortable, give your affiliation, that would be helpful because we have a, a group of human rights people and also a, a group of scientists. So, Tom? Yeah, of course. Th thanks, Laura. Uh, this is really exciting. Rafael, this is amazing work you're doing. Uh, I'm uh, one of the inventors of Siri, one of the founders of the Siri thing that Apple did. Um, and I was uh, one of the founders of the Partnership on AI, which is the sort of a combination of industry and civil rights groups to have a conversation like you're doing with the, with the neural rights. Um, I advise companies now, in fact, I advise Sherpa uh, Shabi, your, your company you mentioned, um, and also a, a, new, a company doing neurotech for assistive technology. So for people who can't speak, yep. um, there's, there's a really a big breakthrough now and the co company's called Cognition. I'm not here to pitch it, but the, I'm gonna ask you a question about this. So there's a product that we're coming out with that will use e, uh, dry electrode non-invasive EEG um, with AI that makes sense of the signal that can in fact give you enough control over selection in your visual field to be able to uh, essentially drive a speech generation interface uh, in, a, in almost real time, like be able to speak. If yep. you have ALS or cerebral palsy or some neural degenerative disease. So I'd love to hear your advice now going forward because there's a half a billion people on the planet who have speech, who limit to have speech limitations. A half a billion is a lot. And, and many people think it's worse than being blind. Uh, and we have now the potential with the combination of neurotech and AI to actually start to augment this, this impairment and overcome it. Um, it will involve reading brain signals, yep. gathering data from large numbers of people, making models. So how do you suggest that we navigate this so that we can get the benefit uh, without, the, without the ethical consequences, yep. the negative? Thank you, Tom. Uh... First of all, I mean, I'm, I'm honored at your comments uh, coming from you. It means a lot to, uh, to me and to us. Um, and uh, uh, I think also this work on, on, on this company cognition, it sounds like a fantastic uh, idea. Uh, I, I would be all supportive for these type of things. Now, let me tell you how we think about uh, problems, these ethical issues that could come from a successful product. Uh, and I hope uh, you have a successful product. Uh, it's, um, so there's, there's two things that, uh, that I could suggest. One is to partner and to start talking to people like us and to other companies that have similar concerns. So just to put it out there, uh, uh, we organized this meeting uh, as industry academia, uh, um, essentially get together in November uh, on BCIs. And uh, it was, we had a section on invasive BCIs and then a section on non-invasive BCIs and people from Facebook and Kernel and uh, other companies. IBM was actually co-organizer of the meeting. And by the way, uh, we're collaborating with IBM because Dario Hill, the uh, head of research is actually one of the people in the uh, partnership for AI. So he's very interested in, in, in making this part of the agenda of partnership for AI. So one idea, and, and take this as my, my open hand uh, to you and to your company, uh, to, um, to start talking to us, start coordinating, participating in these forums, the discussion, we're building uh, consensus, we're writing uh, platform documents, we're in the process of writing a platform document on this past BCI meeting, we're talking with Facebook about organizing another uh, meeting on non-invasive BCIs, which could be the one uh, that could be uh, critical for you. No? And uh, mm -hmm. so that's just about trying to get in the conversation in terms of how to think about solving the problem. And this is what gives me headaches now because I want companies like yours and Facebook uh, brain to text to succeed. No? 
but how can we do it without uh, breaking the mental privacy? And that's why uh, we need a lot of help from everyone. Um, I encourage you to think of this, uh, again, using the medical model. And you may not be used to, to do that coming from the tech industry, the heart of Silicon Valley, you know? but uh, think of medicine as something with a broader umbrella. That is not just what we traditionally associate with medicine, but something that incorporates the tech, all the tech, okay? Anything that is going to affect the human, let's just put it in there, no? Uh, even if it's non-invasive, in, even a device. No? And then think of the solution that medicine has come over the centuries, which has time-tested. They may not be perfect, but they work. No? So you have a new drug in the market. Well, there is a regulatory body that checks it out to make sure there are no side effects, and then boom. And, and these companies, by the way, they make billions of dollars. They were the largest company on the planet until you guys came along <laughs> in Silicon Valley. So it doesn't kill the business model. It just re, it embeds this uh, code of of the ontology, which comes straight from Hippocrates through the Belmont report, through the uh, IRBs into the heart of the industry. And that sort of rechannels it so that all the products, for instance, the product that you could sell could get essentially the okay in terms of the uh, equivalent of like uh, FDA for, for tech uh, approval and some guidelines. And then their use would be also sometimes regulated if it's if it if, if can lead to augmentation to ensure that we don't end up in a situation where some people are uh, end up uh, with an unfair advantage over other people in, in life. So in this case, that's why I brought up the principle of justice. So this is just one way to think about this problem. Uh, technocratic is another way. Um, human rights is just another way, but uh, I, I encourage you to keep those things in mind. Uh, and of course, the technical solutions, uh, someone like you would appreciate uh, and understand what I'm talking about in terms of, of all this uh, federated learning and differential privacy. Maybe there will be a way there. There's very interesting work, <clears throat> sorry, done in, in Microsoft on a new type of cryptography that could be used for brain data. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rafa. Uh, Grace Alford, Amber? Hi. Um, so I, um, my name is Grace, and I just finished my master's in international relations at the London School of Economics. And so my question for you was, you've talked about bridging these different disciplines and these different communities. And for somebody like me, who's coming from more of a political science background and human rights, what would make me a good partner for you? Yeah. Um, what would we, how can we participate in this? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so when I talk about human rights, I'm flying by the seat of my pants. So you can imagine an MD PhD, I've spent my whole career, 33 years, trying to figure out the, the secrets of the brain circuits in the cortex. So I, never know anything about it. So I'm, I'm, we're partnering and we're working together with experts in human rights. Uh, I have one colleague, uh, Jared Genser, that I talk to a lot. Uh, he's an expert in, uh, he's written a book actually on human rights uh, uh, on the, in the UN. And uh, I think a lot of the solution, at least the human rights part of the solution to the problem, if you agree that this is a, an approach that is in, interesting, involves changing the human rights. And this is very complicated, as you know. So we need to go into the UN and uh, it's gonna be very difficult to start by trying to change the Universal Declaration as you probably can figure this out. But there are all kinds of things that, all kinds of other levels that we can go for. Uh, and this is a, a work of advocacy, essentially, uh, getting these bodies of, of, uh, of uh, of decision-making interested uh, in different countries and trying to build consensus so that things happen. So this could uh, happen through uh, the UN, uh, the UN uh, Commission on uh, the High Commissioner of Human Rights. So this is this would be in, in uh, as you know, in uh, Geneva. Another possibility is the Human Rights Council, which is different. Uh, another possibility could be to create a a special advisor uh, to the Secretary General of, of the UN. Uh, um, so, uh, and within the uh, Human Rights Council, there are many different existing committees on different uh, human rights that could take this as part of their of their work. The Committee Against Torture, 
International Committee of Civil and Political Rights, for example. So you could imagine how through them, this agenda could get plugged in into the, the more the mainstream of the UN and that could change the middle. And suddenly uh, the, this is considered, the cerebral rights are considered as essential human rights by the UN. I think that the reason why we think uh, human rights is a, is a critical um, uh, point here is because not only is more fundamental, uh, it's essentially defines better than any document in, in, in the world, uh, what is a human, what's a human being. And, and it's also widely accepted, not by every country, but every, every human, but I would say by the majority of humanity. But once you have that human rights tree, sort of the branches of the tree come the legislations and the measures in different countries, they all emerge from, they, they uh, nourish themselves in this, this trunk of human rights. So I think if we change that level, then we can have repercussions all, all throughout the, uh, the legal system. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. Anyone else from the audience? I have a question in the chat to me privately asking, could this technology AI lead to collective knowledge and how does this play a role with that data being bought and sold? Yeah, this will revolutionize collective knowledge. This is again, uh, it's very likely that this is all an emergent property game. Uh, so the more emergent properties, the smarter you are. This is what evolution has been doing in, in my humble opinion. So we put together our heads, literally, <laughs> then something uh, serious could happen for good. No? So uh, so I think that's why I'm so bullish about all this technology. No? So uh, uh, now uh, how could this alter the way data are uh, sold and bought? So we're just talking up with Tom Gruber about it. So if, uh, so we think that neural data, in other words, data from the brain, from brain activity, should be defined legally as a different type of data from the standard data so that we can apply to it. And this is what's going on in Chile. They can apply to a different type of legislation to neural data that they can apply to uh, regular data. In a way, they leave the regular data battle as lost. <laughs> but the neural data that's still not out there, in, at least it's not out there in, in a massive way, can still get redefine, rebranded, and then you apply different types of rules to it. And there are many solutions. The Chilean solution is that this data will not be able to be sold or bought. So either we do it all in the device, uh, like with federated learning or something like that, or it's just plain illegal to, to, to sell and buy uh, neural data. It's equivalent to selling and buying an organ of the body. From the point of view of the Chilean law, this will happen. I mean, if this... Uh, uh, neuroprotection law gets approved, this, this is the consequence of that law. No? So you would, just like if you get caught with someone's kidney, you go to jail. You get caught with the data of someone's brain, you go to jail too, because it's essentially a, a, an organ from the point of view of the law. No? So we're talking about the essence of how this new industry should uh, operate. And, and this is very important. Uh, this is very important discussion. These are just some suggestions. I'm not saying that we have the answer here, but this is a suggestion of how, how we're thinking about the problem. Thank you, Rafa. Uh, Joanne? Hi, my name is Joanne Chet. I'm a professor at the School of Public Health, the Mailman School here at Columbia, and I'm the director of the Health and Human Rights Program at the school. I want to applaud your attention to human rights, even though it's not your field, and I appreciate very much the issues that you're struggling with. I guess I have a number of concerns and some of them are gonna make me sound like a Luddite, I guess, but um, what about the human right to decline this kind of augmentation or to see this kind of augmentation as actually a diminution of human dignity? Um, so that's one issue, but it concerns me a lot that we've struggled very hard, partly using the disability convention, which I would really look to in your case much more than the universal declaration. But anyway, using the disability convention, uh, survivors of mental health uh, abuse in, in health systems have really rallied around the idea that a lot of the problem with human rights unfriendly approaches to mental wellness is that there's been too much reduction of mental wellness to brain function and neurons yep. rather than looking at social determinants of mental wellness. And the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health who recently finished his term, Danius Puras, has written brilliantly on this subject. Um, and I, it just, it concerns me a little bit that um, 
we, we, I understand the, the many ways in which this kind of technology can improve human dignity, but that we not sort of reinforce the, um, the approach to mental wellness and mental dignity and the agency of people who have mental health concerns by just by a, a sort of reductionist approach. Yeah. Um, I think first, um, the way that we would think uh, as a group uh, through this issue of consent for mental augmentation is uh, essentially uh, the same way that uh, applying the medical model that you would think about consent for a medical procedure. So you can always decline it. So it's not, uh, but it, it should be under the, under, under the uh, assumption of justice and fairness so that the decision to who gets augmented or not is not one taken by the person, but by an independent body, just like it happens with organ donations and transplantations or medical devices, or like the vaccine, for example, today with COVID, that is independent, uh, that has the justice and fairness as its core value. And they're the ones who make the decision. And if the resources are limited, they're the ones who prioritize the, the, the outlay of application of these technologies. You know? So if, from, if you think like that, then you can imagine that a device that could lead to mental augmentation and non-invasive PCI uh, would be first offer maybe to patients that need it, uh, people that actually need to be mentally augmented and not to the population in general. But then once it's available for the population in general, then you could always have the, the, the again, this is again, you, it's your right. Uh, you, you can take your own life too. I mean, it's your right to live, no? uh, but it's not, uh, it's not forced. No? I think also with, uh, uh, so, so this is a little bit how I would think about that problem, just put in your medical hat, which you have, and think, well, maybe that could be one way that uh, this type of, of long history and, and tradition and, and, and chiseled uh, procedures that we have uh, inherited from previous generations had to do with these difficult ethical issues in the clinic. And I was, I was there too, and I trained uh, on life and death decisions. So those are actually now uh, can have a, a wider application and this new technology that no one knew it could it could it could emerge that could change the, the human condition. So um, so that that are sort of my thoughts on the, the issue with respect to uh, uh, restricting the definition of mental health to if I understand you correctly to strictly biological approach that could be uh, that could have problems because it will not capture the the richness or the uh, or the the sources of causes and, and actions that you could have if you consider mental health more comprehensively. I think, I don't see how this approach would be restrictive. This is just one uh, approach. It doesn't mean that all mental disease, all neurological disease should be, should be, uh, should land in the neurotechnology field. It's just, this is gonna be an important field that could revolutionize neurology and psychiatry. But of course, that doesn't speak uh, to uh, to the other things that are going on. That and most of them are very valuable and should continue to to be. No, so I don't think it's it's actually uh, uh, it's uh, it's in opposition to the contrary. This will be synergistic with other things that that could be done. Uh, before I hand over to Thomas Creeley for what will be the last question, uh, Rafael, I just wanted to note that I have many messages. In, the, in my uh, emails for, about where students can get involved and whether or not Columbia students can um, get involved in this initiative and how they can get involved. Yes, so let me just answer that quickly before we go to Tom. So you can feel free to uh, email me. Uh, uh, I'm going to type in my email, my uni for those of you at Columbia. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, we have this, again, this neuro rights initiative and we're building a network. We're actually just about this morning we were uh, meeting to organize the website for the network and this network could, you could get involved through the network. So uh, so please do that. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Okay, I guess it's my turn. Yes, uh, you can hear Tom Creeley, yes. Uh, I'm a professor at the United States Naval War College and uh, created and uh, direct the uh, ethics and emerging military technology graduate program here. We actually do uh, neurotechnology and national security. We look at human enhancement, brain enhancement. We look at the various ethical implications. 
Uh, if you use neurotechnology for interrogations, can it be considered torture? And so we have an awful lot in common here uh, through our program. We have uh, uh, people from all the services that we select. It's highly competitive and also various federal agencies that come in and this is above and beyond their master's degree to get this certification of ethics, the only kind of its, uh, one of its kind in the US. Um, so, you know, this is definitely important to us as we deal with emerging technologies. We work with DARPA, uh, Joint Artificial Intelligence Center and other federal agencies in looking at how the technology is developed ethically, how it is used ethically, and then how do we deal with our adversaries who use it against us in an ethical way? Uh, and as you said earlier, you know, it's extremely complex and yeah. you know, it is hard, hard answers. And we, we're wrestling with this. And so, um, you know, my objective is to try to bring together, you know, people such as yourself working with Jake and others in order to have a more collaborative relationship um, in this arena. You know, ethics and technology. So, Tom, I'm delighted at your question. You're not going to believe this, but I spent most of the morning today talking about this issue. And let me tell you how it all happened. It was not on our plate. So, um, uh, we sent the landing team of the Biden administration a white paper uh, to uh, build a task force that would look into the problem of new technology and human rights or human rights uh, um, consequence of neurotechnology. And we left AI out, we just focus on neurotech. Now we send this to the State Department, the landing team of the State Department, the landing team of OSTP. We hear back from the uh, incoming <laughs> deputy director of the National Security Council. I said, what does the, I, I had to look it up and say, what exactly do these guys have anything to do with neurotechnology? And then I found out these are the people that decide the kill list. Yeah. I said, I'm be, be sure when I talk to them, <laughs> joking, no? So turns out they're worried about China. Yes, yes, we so are. Turns out the, uh, the Chinese brain initiative that I mentioned, I actually helped them at the beginning when they were thinking through it. Uh, it's supposed to be three times the size of the US and it merges, they discuss it as a plane with two wings. One is neurotechnology, the other one is AI. Mm -hmm. Aim at merging neurotech with AI. And this incoming deputy director thinks that this is of a national security concern. In fact, they uh, circulated with us a couple of internal white papers they had on the issue, specific on China. Mm -hmm. So that's why they contacted us. <laughs> So I spent the morning talking to colleagues of yours so from uh, Georgetown yep. on, uh, on, this, on this issue. So I think, uh, unbeknownst to me, this, uh, it's becoming a, a topic of national security and uh, maybe our contribution could be to put this by helping to put this, framing it as a human rights issue uh, in the case of China, Russia or other uh, actors. It's not uh, the most convincing argument, as you know, in terms, but at least it is an international argument that carries some weight uh, and they could be used by the NEC or the US government as part of the type of uh, uh, portfolio of things that they do to deal with potential uh, national security threats. Now, I have to tell you, China, from my uh, own experience, I'm speaking just for myself, it's a, it's a complex country. Uh, every single... Um, uh, scientists and doctor I've talked to about this issue is firmly on the side of regulating neurotechnology and AI. I haven't heard any negative <laughs> comments from any Chinese on this issue. So I think they're on our side. In fact, one of the 25 people that signed our Morningside paper came from China representing the Chinese Brain Initiative, uh, Dr. Guoping B. And he was vocal and uh, he's actually a neurosurgeon by training. He was vocal in saying, no, no, we need to have some protection for the for the uh, for the citizens from this technology. So I don't think that China it's uh, this black and white uh, uh, simple case. But uh, I think part of our approach could be to try to talk to people in China that are working on the technology to help build a case. Sure. 
Well, I appreciate that, Raphael. Let's uh, keep in touch after this uh, session today because I think there's a lot of synergy and some of the people that we work with uh, in DOD are definitely interested in this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raphael, for a wonderful talk. Um, these interdisciplinary discussions are so important. I hope we will continue the conversation in another talk or panel at another date. Uh, please do sign up for our respective newsletters. And last but not least, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Maggie Medley, our communications coordinator, without whom none of this would happen. So thank you, Maggie. Uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Thank you.